The top stories tonight in Y News. President Rodrigo Duterte likely to approve recommendations to set a price cap on COVID-19 tests. The Food and Drug Administration warns of a circulating message offering a COVID-19 vaccine for 50,000 pesos. Ano man itong pinatempt ibenta na ito, kung fake ito, o kung saan man na ipostip ito, eh talaga pinagsasamantalahan ang mga tao. The Interior Department orders local governments to clear their roads of obstructions within 60 days starting November 16. In the know, what to prepare when traveling to restricted and unrestricted areas and tourist destinations. 10,000 police personnel are now under quarantine in Malaysia. Two lead COVID-19 vaccine candidates, cause of hope for Australia. The first batch of vaccine in the land down under is expected to be delivered early 2021. Good evening, Philippines and the world. Today is Thursday, October 29, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Join us in the next hour as we deliver today's top stories around the country and other parts of the world. We are also seen in 1,935 satellite monitoring centers nationwide and via live streaming worldwide through the UNTV News and Rescue social media accounts and our website, untvweb.com. I am William Theo. First in the news, it is possible that President Rodrigo Duterte will approve the recommendations to set price cap on COVID-19 tests in the country. Meanwhile, some private entities have offered to provide PRC testing for returning overseas Filipino workers. Our palace correspondent, Rosa Licons, explains why. The Department of Health has recommended President Rodrigo Duterte to issue an executive order to mandate a price ceiling for COVID-19 swab tests in private hospitals and laboratories. According to Presidential Spokesperson Harry Roque, the recommendation is now on the President's table awaiting decision. Antay na po muna natin ang decision ng Presidente. Why is that? Eh kasi po, napak yung iba naman, napakataas talaga ng sinisingil. No? Eh alam naman natin na po pwedeng na uh, mas mura yung uh, testing na yan para maging uh, mas affordable lang uh, testing sa ating uh, mga kababayan at sa, sa ganong paraan ay eh, mas marami pong matetesting. Meanwhile, some private entities such as Project Art, a private sector-led initiative, as well as the Philippine Airport Diagnostic Laboratory have offered to provide PCR testing for returning overseas Filipino workers. Ang mensahe po natin, yung mga bumabalik na OFWs, wag po kayong mag-alala Hinding hindi po maabirya ang inyong PCR tests. The Philippine Red Cross has yet to resume its COVID-19 testing services for returning OFWs. Rosa Lecos, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Meanwhile, the Food and Drug Administration warns of a circulating message offering a COVID-19 vaccine worth 50,000 pesos. The FDA reminds the public there is still no approved COVID-19 vaccine until now. Our health correspondent Aiko Miguel explains why. A message written in Chinese has been circulating. It is offering a COVID-19 vaccine in a clinic in Makati City. Food and Drug Administration Director General Eric Domingo says that he has also received the message and he had it immediately translated. Some of my friends na marunong magbasa ng Chinese, ang sinasabi na offer daw siya for 50,000 pesos per dose. Tapos dalawang doses daw ang binibigay. Uh, napakamahal no? kasi talagang tinatarget ng WHO dito na cost ng bakuna is about $10 or 500 pesos bawat isa. Kung ano man itong inattempt ibenta na ito, kung fake ito o kung saan man na ipostip ito, eh talaga pinagsasamantalahan ang mga tao at ang mga willing na magpabakuna ng untested no, or unregistered. During the FDA's inspection yesterday in Centuria Makati Medical, they did not find a COVID-19 vaccine for sale. Yung sa Centuria, wala naman kaming nakita ng ano, no, dahil para uh, pa-filean sila ng, uh, ng kaso. 
Pero yung DOH, I think, is also investigating kasi maraming clinic doon. So, tinitignan lang to make sure na yung mga clinics na yon ay naggagawa sila ng nararapat lamang doon sa kanilang lisensya or kung may lisensya sila or wala. Centuria, for its part, has issued a statement refuting the circulating message. The FDA reminds the public there is still no approved COVID-19 vaccine up to now. Huwag po kayong uh, papatol sa ganito. Kami po ang mismo ang magsasabi sa publiko kung ano ang registered, kung ano ang allowed, kung anong form nito, kung anong itsura nito para asigurado sila. No? At tandaan po natin, mabibili lamang ang mga ito sa so, mga license din ng mga outlet mga pharmacy, mga butika na talaga pong may lisensya at maaaring magbenta ng ganito. Authorities are still investigating who made the message and made it circulate to reach the public. The FDA warns that any facility, establishment or clinic that will be selling unregistered vaccines will face a cease and disease order. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Despite the order to close cemeteries from today until November 4th, the Philippine National Police will watch out for cemetery goers. Our police correspondent Lea Ilagan explains why. Cemeteries across the country are closed for seven days, from October 29 until November 4. But to make sure that no visitors will enter cemeteries on those days, the Philippine National Police deploys a number of police personnel. Joint Task Force Coronavirus Shield Commander, Police Lieutenant General Guillermo Eliazar explains that policemen will be present at cemeteries, columbariums, and memorial parks. Also, police assistance tests will be placed outside cemeteries. Secretary Eduardo Año of the Department of the Interior and Local Government clarifies that after November 4, people may visit the graves of their department relatives. But the minimum health protocols must be strictly observed, such as wearing a face mask and face shields and physical distancing. The closure of cemeteries has been announced by President Rodrigo Duterte since September and local governments must comply. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The Manila Metro Rail Transit System Management will increase the speed of running trains. Joan Nano will tell us why live. Yes, Joan. Carlene, the government has partially replaced the rail of MRT3. Now from 40 kilometers per hour, the MRT management will increase the speed of trains to 50 kilometers per hour beginning November 3. MRT3 Director for Operations Engineer Michael Capati explains that increasing the speed of trains will reduce passenger queues and passengers won't have to wait for long minutes for a train to arrive. Earlier today, the MRT management conducted a simulation of an overhaul train to test the 50 kph speed. They are sure that passengers will be safe despite the increase in the train speed. Here's what MRT3 Director for Operations Engineer Michael Capati said about passenger safety. Of course, safe yan. Ano? Actually, kaya nga may mga simulation niyan bago yung implement eh, para ma-check natin kung may mga technical issues pa. So far, wala kami nakukuha. As of now, Hardin, the government has completed around 40% of the MRT rehabilitation project. There are now 21 train sets operating, including three China-made Dalian trains. And just an advisory for MRT passengers, there will be a rehabilitation and maintenance works to be done this weekend. So MRT's operation will be suspended from Saturday, October 31 until November to Monday. Normal train operations will resume on Tuesday, November 3. Hardin? Uh, John, when was the last time that the MRT was able to run trains by 50 kilometers per hour? And uh, what will be the maximum speed of the trains if the government is able to finish the entire MRT rehabilitation project? Carlene, the last time that the MRT was able to run at 50 kph was back in August 2014 when one of the trains got derailed in Tap Station. As the government completes the entire rail replacement, they are targeting to increase the speed of the trains by 60 kph by December. Carlene? 
Thank you so much, John Nano, reporting live from Kazan City. Meanwhile, the country's Department of Health says that 1,761 new cases were reported today, raising the total confirmed cases of coronavirus infection in the country to 376,935. We have gone down to country number 21 in the tally of territories and countries hit by the pandemic. Quezon City recorded the most single-day cases among regions and cities, with additional patients today with 85. Now the total active cases further increase to almost 40,000. 83.3% are in mild condition, while 10.9% are asymptomatic. We have lost 33 more patients, but through our fervent prayers, medical interventions, and sacrifices of our medical frontliners, 740 more people have won their battle against the invisible enemy. That brings the total number of recoveries nationwide to 329,848. That's the 15th highest number of recoveries from COVID-19 globally. Thanks be to God. Let's now take a closer look at the updated count of coronavirus cases around the world. The COVID-19 pandemic has now reached a total of more than 44.5 million confirmed cases in 190 countries, regions, and sovereignties. The Marshall Islands, an island country in the Pacific, is a new addition to this global tally. The first positive cases of COVID-19 were confirmed among two U.S. Army garrison workers who arrived this week on Kwajalein Atoll as part of an ongoing repatriation program at the missile testing range in the Marshall Islands. The fast-spreading disease has claimed over 1.1 million lives, including at least 4,000 new death cases in the last 24 hours, while more than 30 million patients across the globe have recovered from the new coronavirus infection, the most in India with over 7 million. Thanks be to God. The Department of the Interior and Local Government will resume the implementation of the nationwide road clearing operation starting mid-November. Asher Kadapan Jr. tells us why. The Department of the Interior and Local Government directs all local government units to clear roads from obstructions within 60 days. That's from November 16 until January 15 next year. DILG Secretary Eduardo Año says they expect the local government units down to the barangays to deliver. The measure still aims to provide convenience of the citizens. So, meron pong dalawang buwan uh, ang ating mga LGUs na ipagpatuloy ang road clearing program sa kanilang mga lugar. Ngunit naiintindihan naman po namin na since may mga community quarantine classifications uh, ang ating mga LGU. Due to restrictions, the full implementation of the clearing operations will be allowed only in areas under Modified General Community Quarantine or MGCQ and New Normal or Post-Quarantine Scenario, while those under the General Community Quarantine should partially clear their roads. In areas under Enhanced Community Quarantine and Modified ECQ, the road clearing operations are suspended. Based on the memorandum circular issued by the DILG on Tuesday, the partial implementation in GCQ areas is limited to actual removal or abatement of road and sidewalk obstructions that are considered dangerous to motorists and pedestrians. It should also give way to the establishment of bike lanes that are essential during the time of the pandemic. While the full implementation covers all components of road clearing operations, ridding road obstructions such as vehicular terminals that are not designated by LGUs, venting sites, house encroachments in right-of-way, and other waste materials among others. This, however, exempts park ambulance and public emergency vehicles as well as checkpoints established by the LGU, police, armed forces of the Philippines, and the Interagency Task Force for the Management of Emerging Infectious Diseases. The DILG will validate the LGU's compliance from the 18th to the 22nd of January 2021. LGUs who will fail to comply with the directive will face administrative charges. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News & Rescue, we serve the people, we give glory to God. Some Filipinos are starting to plan to go on a vacation, but it's important to know what the requirements are, despite the easing of antivirus measures. 
Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. After around seven months of being cooped up inside your room or office, you are finally on your way to your well-deserved vacation. But suddenly, you are stopped at a checkpoint and advised to return home as you lack a travel pass through permit or TPP. Totally disappointing, isn't it? That is why it is important to be well prepared and knowledgeable about the things needed before pursuing that road trip or vacation. The Department of the Interior and Local Government has released a guide on travel protocols and policies from the Joint Task Force COVID Shield. When traveling to an unrestricted area such as Metro Manila, there is no need to secure a travel authority. But if the journey would require you to pass through some restricted areas, Although your destination is classified as unrestricted, you need to secure a travel pass through permit. But how is this done? There are not many requirements to get a travel pass through permit. You can even request for one at the police station nearest to you. But going on a trip to a restricted area still requires a travel authority from the police station. Make sure to get a medical certification from your city or municipal health center. A medical certificate is one requirement to get a hold of a travel authority. When planning to go on vacation in a tourist spot, be sure to check the details from an official website or social media account. Some areas require an RT-PCR test taken within 48 hours before arrival just like Purakai. Others require a rapid antigen test taken within 30 hours before arrival just like Ilocos Norte. Other requirements are a copy of confirmed booking of accommodation and or tours, air ticket, and to pre-register through an official website. The Department of Tourism also continues to identify tourism sites that may open in the coming days or months. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Bohol Province is set to open for domestic tourism on November 15. Presidential spokesperson Ari Roque himself visited the territory to promote local tourism. Meanwhile, Bohol Governor Arthur Yap advises local tourists planning to visit Bohol to check the requirements and health protocols before visiting the province through their website tourism.bohol.ph. Visitors are required to submit a 72-hour PCR negative results. Do-it-yourself tours are prohibited. Talaga naman pong iningganan nyo ng ating presidente na buhayin ang turismo para magkaroon po ng hanap buhay ang ating mga kababayan at kaya naman ito kung pangangalagaan natin ang ating mga buhay. In other news, Batangas province was shaken by an earthquake at around 1.25 this afternoon. The magnitude 5 quake was tectonic in origin, according to the Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, or FIVOGS. Intensity 4 was felt in Mabini, San Luis, Lemery, Rosario, Agoncillo, Calatagan, Balayan, Pauan, and Santa Teresita in Batangas and in Tagaytay City, Alfonso and Amadeo in Cavite. Intensity 3 was recorded in Batangas City, Malvar, Talisay, Tanawan, and Alitagtag in Batangas and in San Pablo, Laguna. The Provincial Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Offices of Batangas and Cavite have not recorded any casualty in the earthquake. Now, here's a glimpse of what's the weather like in parts of the country. The trough of severe tropical storm Goni is affecting parts of the country. State Weather Bureau Pagasa says as of 3 p.m. today, Goni was located at 1,505 east of central Luzon with maximum sustained winds of 110 kilometers per hour near the center with gustiness of up to 135 kilometers per hour moving westward at 15 kilometers per hour. This will bring cloudy skies with scattered rain showers and thunderstorms over eastern Visayas and Caraga. Goni is forecast to intensify into a 
typhoon within the next 24 hours. It will enter the Philippine area of responsibility tonight and will be named Raleigh and may landfall over Quezon Aurora area on Sunday evening or Monday early morning. Pagasa is also monitoring another tropical depression. As of 3 p.m. today, it was located at 2,435 kilometers east of Mindanao with maximum sustained winds of 55 kilometers per hour near the center with gustiness of up to 70 kilometers per hour moving west-northwestward at 10 kilometers per hour. Meanwhile, Ilocos Norte, Apayao, Batanes, and Cagayan will experience cloudy skies with scattered rains and isolated thunderstorms due to northeasterly surface wind flow. And Metro Manila and the rest of the country will experience partly cloudy to cloudy skies with isolated rain showers due to localized thunderstorms. And still to come in Y News. Senators welcome inclusion of lawmakers in the mega task force corruption probe. 10,000 police personnel are now under quarantine in Malaysia. Two lead COVID-19 vaccine candidates cause of hope for Australia. The first batch of vaccine in the land down under is expected to be delivered early 2021. For those watching us on YouTube, please click the subscribe button you see on the right side of your screen and ring the bell for notifications. You may also follow us on Facebook. The Department of Foreign Affairs may begin to investigate Philippine Ambassador to Brazil, Marichu Mauro. Rosalie Cos will explain why. As stated in the Philippine Foreign Service Act of 1991, no investigation or separation from service of a chief of mission or ambassador must be done without the authority of the Philippine President. According to Malacanang, President Rodrigo Duterte has given the go-ahead to the Department of Foreign Affairs to investigate the physical abuse allegations against Philippine Ambassador to Brazil, Mari Chumauro. Pinayagan na po ng Presidente ang Department of Foreign Affairs na imbestigahan ang dating Philippine Ambassador to Brazil na si Marichu Mauro. Bilang isang presidential appointee, kinakailangan po ang pagpayag ng Presidente bago maimbestigahan ang dating Philippine Ambassador to, to Brazil, Marichu Mauro. Several CCTV clips show the Philippine diplomat assaulting her household staff several times. The footage was broadcast by a Brazilian media company. Foreign Affairs Secretary Teddy Loxin Jr. has earlier said that DFA's response on this matter involving a high-ranking foreign affairs official will be severe to the fullest extent of the law. Malacanang also gives assurance the ambassador will be held liable. Kinakailangan bigyan ng katarungan yung uh, naging biktima ng karahasan na kasambahay na kababayan natin. After immediate recall, Mauro is expected to arrive in the Philippines next week. Rosalicos, UNTV News and Rescue. We serve the people, we give glory to God. Senators welcome the inclusion of lawmakers in the corruption probe of the mega task force. For Senate President Vicente Soto III, it is a good thing that the Department of Justice was tapped by the President to help the Office of the Ombudsman and the Presidential Anti-Corruption Commission in investigating corrupt officials. It's a welcome thing actually because um, hindi lang Congreso kundi the entire uh, government uh, bureaucracy should be investigated. Mabuti na yung DOJ inatasan. Uh -oh. Sa mayroon namang gumagawa niyang trabaho yan eh, makakatulong lang sila. Senate Minority Leader Franklin Drilon also welcomed the move, saying that no government official, including legislators, is above the law. However, Drilon reminded that the filing of graft cases must be approved by the Ombudsman as the DOJ cannot file cases before the Sandigan Bayan. Meanwhile, Senator Joel Villanueva admitted that he got confused. 
According to the senator, the creation of the task force may be redundant, considering that the ombudsman has the power already to investigate any public official. For Senator Amy Marcus, the move was overdue with the remaining two years of the administration. Meanwhile, for Senator Kiko Pangilinan, it would be a great move if the government is serious and if the administration's close allies will not be favored. According to Pangilinan, there is a possibility that the task force will be used to file fake cases against the members of the opposition. The senator also noted that the problem is that government allies who were involved in corruption allegations are either absolved or tolerated, while some are promoted. Senator Panfilo Lacson has a similar concern. Maganda yung move. Ang problema lang, kung sa at the outset, mag-uutos mag-create ang mega task force to address all corruption. And in the same announcement, meron na agad mga exceptions. Parang effectively, no? without saying it, para siya sabi, huwag niyo sama si Secretary Duque, huwag niyo sama si Secretary Villal. I'm, I'm not trying to say na yung dalawa eh, may kinalaman sa corruption. No. Far from that. Pero para magkaroon kagad ng uh, uh, at the outset, meron agad na hindi dapat galawin, pa, paano magsasaksid naman yung uh, yung effort to curb corruption? Di ba dapat lahat isama? However, the palace denies this, saying that President Duterte's trust with some government officials will not affect the investigation of the task force, just like what happened with the case of former PhilHealth President and CEO Ricardo Morales. Ay, wala naman po sigurong ganon, no? Nagahanap lang po ng ebidensya ang uh, Pangulo. Kahit sino naman po, kahit kalong kalapit sa kanya, kahit uh, gano ang pagpuli niya sa nakaraan, kung meron naman pong uh, ebidensya na katawilian, ay parurusahan ng ating presidente. Senator Cynthia Villar remains as the richest senator in the country. Based on the summary of the 2019 Statement of Assets, Liabilities and Net Worth or SAL and released by the Senate, Villar declared her net worth amounted to over 3.8 billion pesos without any liabilities. It increased by an estimated 300 million pesos from her net worth in mid-2019. Meanwhile, Senator Manny Pacquiao is still the second wealthiest senator with 3.1 billion pesos posted net worth. Next to him is Senate President Pro Tempore Ralph Recto with 567 million pesos. The fourth richest member of the chamber is Senate Majority Leader Miguel Zubiri with 203 million pesos of declared net worth, followed by Senator Bong Revilla with 176 million pesos and Senator Sonny Angara with 142 million pesos, while the senators who declare the least net worth are Senator Christopher Bongo with 18 million pesos, Senator Risa Honteveros with 16 million pesos, and Senator Laila de Lima with 8.3 million pesos. Red tagging is one of the hot issues nowadays, but a law expert says that connecting a person to a leftist or communist group is not a violation of the law. Dante Amento tells us why. Several groups have raised concerns over the issue of red tagging involving some known personalities in the country. Red tagging is the act of labeling, branding, naming, and accusing individuals and or organizations of being left-leaning, subversives, communists, or terrorists. But Attorney George Irwin Garcia clarifies that red tagging itself does not violate the law. It is just simply saying a certain person is a member of a group or belief, like what National Task Force to End Local Communist Armed Conflict Spokesperson Lieutenant General Antonio Parladi Jr. had done. As a military official, it is his way of giving a warning to citizens not to join left-leaning groups. Kung ako naman ay sasabihan na, ay, ikaw ay pulahan, o dilawan ka, may ganun pa nga, di ba? dilawan ka. Why should you be afraid or why should you be ashamed doon sa, sa pagtatag sa'yo na ganun kung wala ka namang ginagawang masama? Garcia also stresses, red tagging has negative effects on an individual. Eh, nakakreate ng chilling effect and therefore, parang nababiolate ang iyong karapatan na Teka muna, parang wala akong karapatang uh, magkaroon ng private life, the right to privacy. 
And at the same time, parang at the same time, I was being accused of something nang wala namang due process of law. Thus, Attorney Garcia adds, any person involved can also ask for protection by the law through the court. A person can petition for a writ of amparo from violation or threat even with the government officials or writ of habeas data to protect personal information. Writ of amparo, uh, may uutusan, may aatasan ng korte para, oy, so protectahan mo yan, you, you have to ensure the safety of this person upang magkaroon ng remedyo. Dante Amento, UNTV, News and Rescue. We serve the people. We give glory to God. And for the news abroad, here's Maria Latoza reporting live from Perth, Australia. Good evening, William. Australia partners with Japan and the United States to finance the undersea cable for the Pacific island of Palau. Meanwhile, the Department of Trade and Industry launched the Make It Happen in the Philippines campaign to investors from Australia and New Zealand. Joining us tonight is one of our fellow correspondents in Australia, Marvi Delphine, to give us the details live. Yes, Marvi. Marielle, Australia, Japan, and the United States will finance the $42 million undersea fiber optic cable as part of a strategic and coordinated Indo-Pacific project to ensure reliable and secure digital connectivity in Palau. The project that will link Palau to the world's longest undersea cable, stretching around 15,000 kilometers that will connect Singapore with the U.S., was announced in a video message aired at the Indo-Pacific Business forum in Vietnam. The joint video message included Japanese Foreign Minister Toshimitsu Motegi with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Australian counterpart Maurice Payne. This comes two months after U.S. Defense Secretary Mark Esper visited the archipelago and Australia volunteered to be a base to counter China's assertiveness in the heavily contested region. Foreign Affairs Minister Maurice Payne said in an official statement, Australia and Palau have a strong bilateral relationship as part of Australia's Pacific Step Up. Australia recently opened its first embassy in Palau. This presence bolters Australia's diplomatic network, already the largest in the region of any country. Meanwhile, the Philippines Department of Trade and Industry soft-launched yesterday the Make It Happen in the Philippines campaign to invite foreign investors from Australia and New Zealand to choose the Philippines as their next investment destination. DTI Secretary Ramon Lopez urged firms from Australia and New Zealand to look into opportunities in the Philippines with its huge domestic market. The DTI will formally launch the Make It Happen in the Philippines campaign next month, and we are yet to see responses from Australian and New Zealander investors. Muriel? Marvin, with Palau's fiber optic cable project being the first three-way cooperation on infrastructure, how important are these underwater cables for promoting a so-called free and open Indo-Pacific? Marielle, underwater cables have become more important strategically as the volume of data in communications has increased, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic where there is a greater amount of time and presence online. For example, in 2018, we have seen the Australian government fund the 4,000-kilometer undersea cable to link the Solomons and Papua New Guinea to Australia's fiber optic cable network. Originally, it was meant to be built by Chinese telco giant Huawei. Now, with this project, it is worthy to note that Palau is one of Taiwan's four remaining diplomatic partners among Pacific nations, according to the Taiwanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Muriel? All right, thank you, Marvi, reporting live from Australia. Meanwhile, in the USA, election battleground states of Pennsylvania and North Carolina will be receiving mail-in ballots three days after the November 3 election after court decision. Sonny Cause from California, USA will tell us why. The United States Supreme Court allowed on Wednesday the states of Pennsylvania and North Carolina to extend receiving mail-in ballots even after November 3. Newly confirmed Justice Amy Connie Barrett, appointed by U.S. President Donald Trump, did not participate in the vote, stating that there was no time for her to review the argument on both sides. 
Pennsylvania and North Carolina are both being contested by Trump and Biden for the November 3 election. The Republicans have pushed election officials and courts to stop counting mail-in ballots after November 3 and have been consistent in questioning the integrity of the mail-in voting system, saying that it is open to fraud and manipulation. Democrats in Congress, on the other hand, said reported delays in mail-in deliveries in some U.S. cities could hinder the delivery of ballots in time for November 3 election. Yesterday, U.S. District Judge Emmett Sullivan in Washington ordered the U.S. Postal Service or USPS to distribute guidance to its workers by tomorrow of the need to make sure that completed ballots reach the appropriate election officials by the state's designated deadline. He also directed USPS to release daily reports of mail-in deliveries, participate in daily court conferences, and take the necessary steps ensuring timely deliveries of mail-in ballots. U.S. Postal Service said that it has delivered more than 100 million blank or completed ballots since early September and does not recommend mailing ballots less than seven days before state deadlines. Sonicos, UNTV News and Rescue USA. We serve the people. We give glory to God. Meanwhile, some updates on COVID-19 situations and COVID-19 vaccine development. In Thailand, visitors to Thailand may now avail their five-day COVID-19 insurance online, according to the Office of Insurance Commission, or OIC. Charis Nongbawen, who is now in Thailand, will tell us why live. Yes, Charis. Mariel, a medical insurance amounting to at least 100,000 US dollars, or equivalent to 3.16 million baht, is one of the required documents for foreigners who are considering traveling to Thailand during the COVID-19 pandemic, according to Tourism Authority of Thailand or TAT Governor Yutasak Supason. But TAT had announced from the OIC that the said insurance may now be availed online before traveling to Thailand. Travelers to the kingdom may purchase their medical insurance by visiting the Thai General Insurance Association or TGIA's website, which is covid19.tgia.org. The availed insurance coverage will start upon arrival in the country. Under the said insurance, the patient will not need to have advanced payment or out-of-pocket expenses in case admitted to a private hospital. And in case of COVID-19 death, the same insurance amount of 100,000 US dollars or around 3.16 million baht will be given by the insurance company to the beneficiary. Mariel? Therese, for those who are interested to avail the Thai-based or Thai-based COVID-19 medical insurance, how much will they have to pay? Mariel, the insurance package vary from 30 days to one year. For premium packages, price may range from 1,600 to 4,800 baht for 30-day coverage, 2,880 to 8,640 baht for 60 days, 3,840 to 12,160 baht for 90 days, 7,680 to 23,040 baht for 120 days, and 14,400 to 43,200 baht for those who would like to avail for one year. Mariel? Thank you, Cherise Longbawen, live from Thailand. In Malaysia, 10,000 police personnel are now under quarantine. Oselito Likidolf explains why. Kuala Lumpur. With a pandemic reaching critical level, a record high number of cases, 10,000 police personnel are now under quarantine, with over 200 of them testing positive for coronavirus and undergoing treatment. According to Home Minister Datuk Sari Hamsa Sainuddin, because of the nature of their work, many of the policemen had been infected despite wearing masks. Policemen in red zone areas during operations and checks as they manned 500 over roadblocks, especially during the movement control order or MCO phase since the COVID-19 hit the country. In addition to this, social distancing is not something that can be practiced as a police officer in a given situation. The police are now considering the situation as a security concern since it has limited the deployment of their personnel. Early February, the outbreak started in Malaysia with a number of positive patients accumulating to about 10,000 in seven months. But with the current third wave, it reached about 11,000 in just two weeks. 
The impact on the police force, which has over 100,000 members in all divisions, considered as one of the frontliners during the pandemic, had to endure the situation despite being tired. Many had worked tirelessly and had not taken off days or leave in the last 10 months. Datuk Seri Shamsa added, The police have been stretched to the fullest as they are also helping the immigration department prevent foreigners from entering the country illegally. And many of these illegal immigrants are also COVID-19 carriers, Hamza said. Recently, 497 illegal immigrants and 26 skippers have been detained, while 56 illegal immigrants have been deported. Usilito Likido, UNTV News and Rescue, Malaysia. We serve the people, we give glory to God. The Health Minister of Australia is optimistic that a safe and effective vaccine will be available in Australia early next year. Mavia Dog, who is now in Queensland, will tell us the details why live. Yes, May. Marielle, Australia's Health Minister Greg Hunt has recently updated the Parliament regarding the country's vaccine strategy. He said that Australia is on track for the first batch of COVID-19 vaccinations to be delivered in the first quarter of 2021. There are currently two lead vaccine candidates in which the federal government has invested over $1.7 billion. Those are the Oxford University's AstraZeneca vaccine and the molecular clamp being developed at the University of Queensland. The AstraZeneca vaccine, which is considered as a front-runner, is now in its late-stage phase 3 trials. On the other hand, the University of Queensland's molecular camp aims for approval for mid-next year. Here is what Minister Hunt said for his update to the Parliament. In relation to the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, there have been very positive reports this week of strong T-cell and antibody response to the vaccine. It means that we are on track for first vaccines to be delivered in the first quarter of 2021. Equally, the results coming out of the early phase trials uh, in relation to the molecular clamp are also very positive. That's a cause of hope for Australia, but it's a cause of hope for the world. If proven to be successful, both vaccines will be produced by Australia's only vaccine manufacturer, CSL. Russell Basser, the senior vice president of Securus, the research arm of CSL, says that a huge and important responsibility are now in their hands, but he doesn't see any politicization of the process. The Australian government assures that any vaccine candidates will have to pass the assessment and approval process of the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Back to you, Marielle. Maeve, can you please tell us who will be prioritized to receive the vaccine? Marielle, Australia's priority list includes older Australians as they are more vulnerable, also the health and aged care workers, and also Indigenous Australians. But there are also different attitudes that can be seen in Australia towards COVID-19 vaccinations despite the country's unprecedented surge. A survey of 2,000 people conducted by Vox Pop Labs for ABC showed that 40% believe that the COVID-19 vaccine will be very safe when it becomes available, while 30% said mostly safe and 17% responded with somewhat safe. Aside from this, 64% said they are very likely to get the vaccine, while 12% said they are either very unlikely or somewhat likely. Marielle? Thank you, Mavian Dog, for those updates on Australia's vaccine candidates, live from Queensland. Singapore plans to provide new biometric scans for all immigration checkpoints to allow for passport-free travel. One of our Singapore correspondents, Roy Cheka, will tell us why. Yes, Roy. Marielle, Singapore is making a step towards a passport-free future with new facial and iris scans replacing fingerprint scans at all immigration points, announced by the Immigration and Checkpoints Authority, or ICA, yesterday. Singaporeans, permanent residents, long-term pass holders, and other travelers can register their biometrics with the ICA. However, children below 6 years old must still use the manual clearance lanes since their biometric features are still considered to be developing. ICA said that the technology will be a more reliable form of authentication 
compared to the fingerprint, having 250 feature points for iris scans compared to just 100 points for fingerprint scans. This will also help with COVID-19 procedures by providing touch-free technology that does not require any physical contact with a machine, allowing for a hygienic process. Singapore hopes to have this passport-free immigration system at all land, sea, and air checkpoints by 2022. Marielle? Roy, will foreign visitors be able to use these new biometric scans in Singapore? Uh, yes, Marielle. Foreign visitors will need to enroll their biometric details with the ICA when they arrive in Singapore for the first time. They can either approach ICA officers at the checkpoints or visit ICA immigration immigration facilities. Ariel? Also, are there any improvements on these new biometric scans provide compared with the older ones? Uh, yes, Marielle. The new biometric scans, especially the iris scan, is stable against aging. As our irises will practically remain the same throughout our lives, our irises also contain a more varied and unique set of patterns compared to our fingerprints. So travelers who experience issues verifying their identities due to aging, scarring, or having dry fingers will benefit from these new biometric scans. Marielle? Thank you, Roy Cheka, for your report live from Singapore. And uh, those are the reasons behind the news here in Australia and in other parts of the globe. For those watching us on YouTube, please click the subscribe button you see on the right side of your screen and ring the bell for notification. You may also follow us on Facebook. Back to you, William. Thank you, Maria Latosa, reporting live from Perth, Australia. And those are the reasons behind the news, October 29, 2020. I am Harleen Delgado. Reasons we deliver to you as they unfold, I'm Angelo Castro III. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. I am William Theo. We serve the people. We give glory to God.